quick snap. One man breaking through the wall of blockers, but then the blockers operating effectively to get Pennant out around the end. Fine block by Harrison, and it gave us a first down on the Nebraska 10-yard line. We all ought to bow down in the direction of Lawton, Oklahoma today. I guess. I'm really grateful to them, Howard. It got us out of a real deep hole. What is the rule on the touchdown we got after we kicked off and uh, recovered the ball in the end zone? Well, a kickoff is the only remaining onside kick in the game. Now, a number of years ago in football, in fact, it's almost ancient history in football, if you were behind the kicker at the time the ball was kicked on a punt or any other type of play, or the kicker himself who kicked the ball could go down the field covering the kick, and if he fell on the ball, then the ball belonged to him. Uh, that rule through the years became very difficult to administer because it was hard to tell whether a man was actually behind the kicker or whether he was a step ahead of the kicker when the ball was kicked. And so the onside rule was taken out of the normal scrimmage play. But on a kickoff, it's very obvious whether you're behind the ball or not. And so the onside kick rule is still in effect on a kickoff play. When you kick the ball off, as soon as it has gone 10 yards, it's a free ball. Either side can recover it. And unfortunately, yesterday, the Nebraska boy, for about a second and a half, forgot that it was a free ball and enabled Joe Rector to come down and fall on it in the end zone for a touchdown. The interesting part about the play is that Bill Jennings, Nebraska's coach, told me after the game that the halfback who was playing on the opposite side of the field, as the ball was kicked, saw it bouncing erratically and knew it would go into the end zone. So he called over to his teammate and said, let it go, let it go. Uh, the Nebraska boy momentarily misunderstood. He let it go all right because his teammate had met, let it go in the end zone and down it there. And while he hesitated that second and a half, uh, Rector got the jump on him and made the recovery. Uh, it's just one of those mistakes, and uh, I know that I've made a great many mistakes in my time, and I think perhaps some of you have made an error, too. This unfortunate Nebraska player uh, made his in front of 35,000 people, and I guess it will be remembered for a while. Let's take a look at the play. Oklahoma's lined up. Raleigh kicks off. You can see the Nebraska boy hesitate here while his teammate says, let it go. He remembered, he dove for the ball, but Joe Rector beat him to it by one step, and we got the easiest six points there that we've had all year and that we perhaps will ever get again. But uh, uh, in a football team, in coaching a football team, is it possible to think, well, the team has gotten real good now and we're winning, so let's just stay as good as we are. Is it possible to maintain a level with that kind of thinking? I don't think so, Howard. Uh, in football, at least, uh, you either continue to get better or you start down the other way, you get worse. And uh, the opposition's always improving, so you better try to improve, too. Well, you know, it's about the same with companies. Take Kerr McGee is constantly trying to improve uh, the Deep Rock products you find at the neat white station with the blue and yellow stripes, Deep Rock gasoline, Deep Rock motor oil. Of course, it goes beyond the products that you and I usually think of when we think of Kerr McGee. Kerr McGee has a wide variety of products, and they're always continually trying to make them better and better. For example, here's Kermac Pipeline Outer Wrap. Gives positive protection to pipelines all over the world. This is a product of Kerr McGee. And there are so many others, too. Here are supersonic planes powered by Kermac Jet Fuel. Another user of Kerr McGee Fuels here, powered by a Kermac, Deep Rock rather, diesel fuel. Smooth riding highways serviced with Kermac Asphalt, a product of Kerr McGee. And from Kermac refineries also come raw materials for petrochemicals to produce plastics, paints, detergents, insecticides, synthetic fibers, and a thousand and one articles of everyday use. Heating oils, and industrial oils, lubricating oils, solvents, just the complete gamut of products, all made in Oklahoma by an Oklahoma company. A company that's building not only for today, but also for the future. And that's interesting, because right here, is the source of one of the greatest energies man has ever found. This is uranium ore, and locked in here is atomic energy. This uranium ore comes from Kerr McGee operations in New Mexico or Arizona. I'm not quite sure which one, but right here you see it. This is the real thing, uranium ore. And if it was in color, you could see it's a little yellowish or gold here, and there's a line of black and a little gold over here, and I'm not sure where the uranium is, but it's probably ruining my watch right now. But you get the idea that Kerr McGee is developing fuels of today and fuels of tomorrow, constantly achieving progress to serve you. Bud, that uh, yesterday on the opening kickoff, uh, we 
took the penalty and we they kicked off to us again and we were in a little worse shape. Now, why did we do that? Well, I guess we shouldn't have hard. It was a bad error. On the opening kickoff, the Nebraska kicker hit the ball in the middle and it took an erratic bounce. It broke down the timing of our return and we only got the ball out to about the 26-yard line. Uh, we thought with their being penalized five yards and kicking from their 35, we would get a better return. But on the following kickoff, the ball took an even more erratic bounce. It went right over Clendon Thomas's head. And uh, when we finished running it back, we were on the nine yard line instead of the 26. So it was a very bad choice. Let's take a look at those two plays. This is the opening kickoff. The game is underway. It was a low bounding kick. Sandifer took it on a high hop, ran very well, and got the ball out to the 26-yard line. But Nebraska was offside on that play, so we took the five-yard penalty, which meant that they were going to kick the ball the next time from the 35-yard line. On this kick, the ball must have hit a piece of ice or something because it took a skipping high hop, went right over Clinton Thomas's head. Sandifer had to come from way across the field to get the ball, the Nebraska men covering were able to move down quickly and knock him out of bounds on the nine-yard line. Uh, we could not make a first down from there. Uh, we were forced to kick, and when we uh, finished kicking, Nebraska had the ball on about our 35-yard line, and from that point, they drove it in for the touchdown. The opening play of this drive was a sweep around our left end, and the right halfback moved the ball to the 16-yard line, where it is now... Nebraska, deep in our territory, first and ten. The quick handoff was stopped very nicely by Don Stiller, our left end, second down and ten. The quick pitch out, and Stiller shot the gap to throw the left halfback for a six-yard loss. At this point, we looked to be in pretty good shape, third and sixteen. A very nice fake and fine running by the quarterback together with a very fine throw, gave Nebraska a completed pass and first down on the Oklahoma seven yard line. First down and goal to go. The opening play was the sweep again that put them in scoring position, but this time we stopped it for a yard gain. Second down, six to go for the touchdown. Quick toss and the running pass, but the ball was slightly overthrown, incomplete. Third down, goal to go. This is very fine execution by the University of Nebraska. The quick toss to their left-handed halfback, Nouveau, and he throws into the end zone for the Nebraska score, which put them ahead 7 to nothing. They didn't look like a team that had only been beat, uh, only won once this year, but Well, I guess people are tired of hearing coaches say hard that there's very little difference in teams, but uh, the fact still remains that on any given day, anyone can beat anyone else. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think most of you perhaps know that Kansas State came awfully close to defeating Michigan State, one of the real power teams in the country. At the end of the third, third quarter, the score was 9-7, to seven, and during that third quarter, uh, Kansas State had had the ball once on the one-foot line and once on the one-yard line. If they had uh, scored either of those times, they very easily might have defeated Michigan State. Uh, a few weeks ago, when we played the Wildcats and won 13 to nothing, many people were pretty disappointed that we weren't a better football team, but... Uh, I'm very happy that yesterday Kansas State uh, showed people not only in our part of the country, but all over the country, that they are very capable. That margin of difference is really narrow. Everyone seems to comment this year on how tough the OU line is defensively. Now, what is the most important factor in a line being very good on defense? Well, you have to be able to keep your opponent away from your body so that you're free to move to the ball. Uh, the fundamentals of line play on offense are exactly opposite of the fundamentals on defense. When you're on offense, you're trying to get contact with your opponent. Hit, keep contact, and then push your opponent one way or the other. Now, when you're on defense, you have to avoid contact. You want to charge because you have to protect your area, but you hope to knock your opponent away and then have freedom to move. And, of course, if you can do that, you're in position to operate. Now, there are two fundamental charges that uh, most defensive lines use. Uh, the first is what we call a hand shiver, where you catch the opponent uh, with your hand. But the palm of your hand, of course, is a rather small contact area. And some coaches prefer what we call the forearm shiver. If you're using the forearm shiver, you have the hand, the forearm, and the upper arm are all that can be used to protect yourself. Uh, if you'll step out here with me, Howard, I'll try to demonstrate these charges. 
Uh, I'm the defensive lineman, and Howard is on offense. And as he charges at me, I want to catch him with my hands and keep him away from my body so that I'm free to slide one way or the other and get to the ball. Now, if in making this charge, my hands are too high and he gets to my body, he now can block me and take me out of the play. The real fundamental defensive error is to let them get to your body. So the first charge that we try to teach is the hand shiver where we catch with our hands and keep the man away from our body and then move laterally to the ball. Uh, the other one is the forearm shiver, where when he charges into me, I hit with my forearm, lift him, knock him back, and then move to the ball. Well, some of you young football players might wonder which is best, the hand shiver or the forearm shiver, and I think it really depends a little bit on how you're built. If you're compactly built, then you have strength close to the ground. And uh, if you are strong, close to the ground, I think your hands are perhaps the best charge to use. But if you're real tall, and your opponent is built compactly, as you charge with your hands, he may get underneath you. It's a small area, and if he ever gets to your body, he has you licked. So the taller you are, I think the better perhaps it is to use your forearm, and as he charges into you, you now can be strong from the ground up because it's a great deal of surface with your forearm. Now, other things being equal, if we had our choice at the university, we'd like to have everybody use the hand shiver. Even though I catch you with my forearm very accurately as you come into me, you're still quite close to my body, and I'll have trouble moving laterally to the ball. But if I can use my hands well, as you charge out at me, you're a long way from my body now, and I can push off and move to the ball carrier very quickly. Let's take a look at a few defensive plays yesterday, which will try to bring out this point. Uh, if you watch Searcy at the top of the picture here, he plays off the halfback and makes a very fine defensive play. Watch Joe Rector at the bottom of the picture. Joe hits one man, hits another, fights through, and makes the tackle behind the line of scrimmage. On this next play, watch number 84, Ross Coyle. Ross is the man at the bottom of the picture in the clean jersey. The play starts his way. He hits with his hands, pushes his opponent off his body, and moves in to make the tackle at the line of scrimmage. That's the type of defensive play that we hope to get, and which all teams get sometimes, but uh, you don't get it all the time either. Time out. Let's bring in Stuart Wolf. <laughs> I think it would be a good idea. idea. Uh, when I've talked to different people when we've been on football trips this year, uh, an almost inevitable question has come up. Uh, is football good for boys of uh, junior high school or even grade school age? Uh, is Little League baseball good? And really, I don't know too much about those things, so I thought that it would be well to bring in a well-informed person who could answer those questions for us. Dr. Stuart Wolf of the University of Oklahoma Medical School has done a great deal of research on this subject, and he's consented to come in and talk to us about it. Uh, Stuart, it's a pleasure to see you. Right, Thank nice you very to see much you for again. coming. Good to see you, Stuart. All right. uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is whether competition as such is good for young boys of grade school age. Well, but I think it's one of the most wonderful things that can happen to a young boy because it gives him a lesson in life, a lesson in how to use himself. Let's take one of the most important parts of our body, the hand. If this were protected all our lives and we never had a chance to really use it and try it against something, it probably wouldn't be useful when we needed it. Any kind of a challenge is helpful to a person and even other forms of life. Let's take the humble oyster, for example. The finest thing that this oyster can produce is a pearl. And yet, this would never have happened if an irritating piece of sand hadn't gotten inside of this oyster and made him have to adapt, made him have to do something about it. So I think this sort of thing is terribly important. Also, in especially bodily contact sports, Bud, competition makes a person have to make a decision, a decision that later in life, when one's playing for real stakes, may make a tremendous difference. People have often said that competition is the cradle of anxiety. Well, it's certainly true that if you're in a difficult situation, competitively, where you may possibly lose, that anxiety may occur. But this isn't necessarily a destructive thing. As a matter of fact, there's some very interesting research along this line. Often, competition and effort will make for the relief of anxiety. 
I know many of you have read books and, and newspapers particularly where there have been violent crimes performed by very mild people. He was a model boy. He always was so kind to his mother. He was usually a person who wasn't allowed to express himself in a competitive way at home, often wasn't allowed to engage in sports. So I think this has to be taken with a grain of salt. Well, how about the losing factor? That's something that uh, mothers always ask about. Their child plays in a game and he gets beat and he can't eat and he's worried and he can't sleep and therefore it must not be a good thing for him. Well, I don't go along with that either, bud, and I know you don't. That here again is a very important educational value for a youngster who can work under close supervision to be able to be put in a position where he may win or he may lose. I know I don't have to tell you, bud, that times come up in life when you may be on top and other times when you have to know how to lose. And this is something that's terribly important to learn young. Take with our medical students, for example. Most that we try to teach them is to take responsibility effectively for patients. And the way we teach them is to actually give them responsibility. But give it under supervision. Here they get a chance to see the triumphs of medicine. It's true. But they also see us fail, see us lose, despite our very best efforts. And by having this experience themselves in both directions, they graduate able to take this responsibility. Well, you know, the other factor that a lot of mothers mention to me is that uh, their child is engaging in one of these bodily contact sports, like football or basketball, that he comes home and he's so tired that he can't study. And you really go to school to educate your mind, and therefore competition in uh, a rugged way must not be good because the child is too fatigued to do the number one thing for which he goes to school. <laughs> but I think this is a very common misnomer. Actually, we have built in ourselves a regulating device, or you might say it's a thermostat, that keeps us from putting out our very best effort. As a matter of fact, let me show you here. At times when we think that we're doing our very, very best and putting out our utmost effort, we're likely to be performing about 50% of our actual ability to do something. Now, with training, it's possible to increase this to some 60% or even more. But nevertheless, we're left with a very, very comfortable margin of safety. Well, is a little bit of that, Doctor, the fact that you have a mental block as to uh, how well you can do? The thing that I'm thinking about, of course, is the four-minute mile. People were trying to run the mile in four minutes for some 25 years, and no one was able to do it. Uh, then a few years ago, Roger Bannister cracked that mental barrier, and uh, within a year, I think some four or five other people had run the mile under four minutes. I, I think that maybe indicates that we all have a little more potential than we're able to use. You've thought of a much better example <laughs> than I could, bud. Uh, the other thing that uh, a lot of parents mention to me is that football's too rough, that if you compete in football, you're really running the risk of serious bodily injury, and therefore it's not a very good game to play. Well, here again, bud, I think we've got to emphasize this educational business. Suppose a little boy were never allowed to climb a tree then later on, when he has to use his muscles and his grace and his wit, perhaps in something involving climbing, he's liable to break his neck or, or break his leg anyway, or keeping a child away from a stove because they're afraid that he'll burn is not the way to teach him how to keep from being burned. Now, I think this business of coming up against rough experiences in our life is tremendously important. Again, not just for man, but for all of the children of Mother Nature. Take a block of wood, for example. Rough, initially, what can you make out of this? Well, you can't make anything very beautiful or very useful until it actually comes in contact with a rough experience, like the roughness of a piece of sandpaper. Well, I think it's the same way with you and me, bud. The rough challenges and experiences that we have in our lives that we have to adapt to like the oyster may make us make something really lovely. Well, the last thing I'd really like to ask you is whether competition as such uh, you think is beneficial or whether competition as such might be harmful. Well, certainly, Bud, the competition is not only useful, but it's really essential to a person. 
they are bad aspects of almost any force in human nature or in nature herself. People for years have tried to legislate against uh, human nature, try to make believe that people were different from what they were, but it's sort of like trying to legislate the power out of water. You can't legislate it out, but you can channel it. And I think that what competition in sports and games early in life with youngsters does is to provide a cha channel for this urge, which is natural in children, competition. And it provides a stimulus for doing something really great, something constructive. Let's just take something maybe even more timely than our problems with Notre Dame, uh, Bud, and think of the Sputnik. If it hadn't been for the competitive challenge of Russia, we wouldn't make the strides in science that we're going to make from now on, beginning with our grammar school and high school children and making the greatest kind of scientists in the world. Well, Dr. Wolf, I really want to thank you for taking the time from your schedule to appear on the program. and. I'm very grateful for the information that you brought us, and on behalf of the listeners, I certainly would like to thank you. Appreciate it. It was wonderful, Stuart. Thank you. You know, competition, again, results in the best products for you to use. For example, take gasoline and oil. Because there are so many good ones, Kerr McGee produces some of the best also. Let's take a look at this film. You'll see why. Pike's Peak, scene of one of the toughest tests for motor oil. One car was filled with Deep Rock Special All Season Motor Oil. A good grade of ordinary oil went into another car. And boy, it's cold up there, five below zero. Both cars were left overnight. In the morning, both oils were drained. The ordinary oil was so stiff, it had to be scooped out. The Deep Rock Special Oil drained freely. Didn't stiffen even below zero on top of Pike's Peak. This means easy starting, longer engine life. It's so good, you get a million dollar engine insurance product warranty free with Deep Rock Special or with Deep Rock Air Race HD. You'll be happy with Deep Rock, a product of Kerr McGee sold by your independent business neighbor. Try Deep Rock neat white stations with the blue and yellow stripes. Thank you. Well, there's one other team in the state yesterday, bud, that scored 32 points, and that was OSU, and, and OU plays them next week. And they're pretty good this year, aren't they? Well, I really believe that uh, Coach Spiegel and the fine coaches at the uh, Oklahoma State have done a marvelous job this year. They have a good squad. They brought them along very well, and uh, their record is really one of the best in the country. Uh, as I indicated a little bit earlier, I think that uh, any team can beat any other on any given Saturday. I know that uh, Oklahoma State's been looking forward to this game all year. I think it will be the toughest that we've played because they really are after <laughs> the university, and I certainly hope that we can play as well as we can. Well, uh, they've got a couple quarterbacks who can pass, haven't they? Well, their attack is really much better balanced than ours. Uh, Sorgel and Cross have thrown the ball very effectively all year, and if you are going to move it well against a good defensive team, you have to have balance. You have to be able to run inside, outside, and you also have to throw the ball. They have excellent balance in their attack, and they're one of the leading defensive teams in the country. Uh, I really feel that, uh, as I said earlier, with the possible exception of Texas and Notre Dame, they're, without question, the best team that we have met all year. We have an opportunity, us fans, uh, we fans have an opportunity Saturday of just cheering in general because we can be proud of all 22 boys that are going to be on that football field at any given time. So we'll say on behalf of the folks at Kerr McGee, good luck to you and uh, good luck to Coach Spiegel, too, and we hope that it's a great game. We know it will be. Thanks a lot for looking in. Stay tuned for Chris Daniels and the game film. We'll see you next Sunday. Bud Wilkinson has been brought to you by Kerr McGee. Producers of Deep Rock Gas and Oil to give you smoother driving, Kermac Asphalt to give you smoother riding, Diesel Fuel to power the railways, Jet Fuel to power the airways, Kerr McGee, pioneer in offshore drilling methods, leader in finding and developing fuels for the future, and Oklahoma organizations developing better ways to make nature's energy go further. <laughs>